And welcome back. This is Frost Gaming 25. And uh, today we're doing a little bit of a special episode here. We are going to be covering the basics and advanced of electricity, pretty much as much of the electricity as I can. So we're going to be hopefully giving everybody a very insightful, um, up to date bit of knowledge to what electricity does in the front so let's get started here so to get this all started we have a bunch of things as you can see but we'll get to that momentarily um, but let's start with the basics here so if you have if you look right here we have our generator the generator can be loaded with fuel and that is how it makes its power so if we hold down our interact button which some people it's F for me it's E um, but you can go ahead and click start or open in this case we already opened it we know that there's fuel in it we can turn it on it powers this light the cable it just is locked into fixed points so if we bring out our cable tool here we could if we wanted to string together a piece of the light here so the light turns off but if I want to I can click down and it will allow me to fix on a point if I wanted to make this cable do a shape like that I could do that and you can click where you want the cable to actually go and be placed so that is how the cabling works all the way up to the fluorescent light so the fluorescent light obviously it's lighting up this area it makes it a little bit brighter you can additionally if you had another fluorescent light if I were to put down one more fluorescent light I could say, well, let, let's make this fluorescent light attached to this fluorescent light. And now the power from this from this generator is going into the fluorescent light, which is then the excess goes into this one. If we look from here, we can see that currently the power in this is 239 that's being output. And then in here, it's saying we're taking in 239 and we're going to output 238. The reason being is because this uses one power, the fluorescent light uses one power, and so does this one. And the generator is able to output 240. So by the time we get to the end of this, it's 238. So two power, both of these requires two power. This thing generates way more than that, so there's no problem there. So the let so the first thing that i have to mention is these generators generate 240 as we mentioned power the problem with the batteries currently and this may be a bug or may be purposeful i don't know yet but the problem that you might encounter when you're using batteries to store power is that the most that the generator or the the input will take from that one battery is 30. So this lead acid battery, this is the first one you get, the most power it'll intake is 30. But the most it'll output is 60. It will output double the most that it can take in at any given point. So if you have something that requires say 31 power or more it will not output that it won't do anything you'll get nothing happen if i were to hook up if i were to hook up a uh, say this mine shaft right here as you can see it's running right now but if i turn this off the mine shaft requires 215 power if i were to hook up a mine shaft to this battery you will not be able to power it it won't run at all nothing will happen it'll it'll sit there and nothing will happen and you just kind of are sitting there like okay it's not working if you hook it up to this lead acid battery cluster it still is not enough it only goes to 160 so that's still not enough to actually power and the most it'll take in is 80 power with the most it'll output is 160 so you can see with a single one it's 30 input and 60 output this one the 
lead acid battery cluster is 80 input and 160 output. Then you go to the titanium battery, which has a input of 100 and an output of 200. But if you can see here, that means this titanium battery by itself is still not enough to actually power this mine shaft. And we can also say the same for this well. If I turn this off, this well also requires 215 power. So neither of the tier one item generators that you can have, which is the oil generator and the ore generator, both of these will not run off of even a titanium battery by itself. It will just, it'll take the power input, but it won't do anything with it. These will cease to function. The only way you can run off of just one battery is to actually take this large titanium battery cluster as the output. And the beauty with this one is that it'll take an input. As you can see, it says 239. Well, that's because we're running this generator, but not this one. So if we turn this generator on, it requires two inputs from two different generators in order to reach its max capacity, as you can see here, of 250. It now capped out at 250 input can come in, and it will output 500. Now, these would officially now run off of one of those but this is like a really really in-game item this you don't even you won't get this until you're uh let's see let's, let's see how far down the tech tree you get this one so this one is quite literally unlocked the third to last one of the third to last things you actually get i don't know exactly the level but it's it's definitely up there so you don't want to count on it being the case because I know for a fact this is unlocked to level 41. So you're talking at least level 56 maybe that you unlock this titanium battery cluster. So anyway, back to where we were. So if the power is coming in at 30, outputs at 60, if we are turn this on, we can you can see that the circuit breaker is a way of turning things on and off. So on and now off. Um, it gives you some kind of a control as to how you want something, let's like say you wanted lights in your base and you wanted them to turn on all of them simultaneously once you pull this light switch. You can do that with this circuit breaker. Now, um, with that being said, there are other uses you can do with batteries. You can actually hook them up in uh, series and in parallel, um, which I can quickly try to demonstrate here. If I were to take this battery and we were to take this output here, this isn't probably the best example of it, but you can see the input right here and the outputs right here. If we were to take this and hook it up to that, so now what is happening is the power from this battery is going to drain into this lead acid battery, which essentially effectively gives it a buffer, meaning that I'm not gonna get as much power output. Well, in this case, it's actually more because this thing can't output as much, but this thing will deplete itself because it's, I mean, if there was actually something attached to this, that used 160 power, it would deplete itself because the most it's actually inputting is 30. And the reason why it's 30 is because right here, this is the bottleneck. This is what I would call a bottleneck where even though this generates 240 power, this is only allowing 30 in and it's exporting 60. And so eventually this will reach nothing. It'll go down to zero as you can see by the number going down constantly. And then it'll go into here, and this will keep going up unless if there's something that's costing more than 30, you'll see it go down as well. But what this does is it allows you to have, uh, this is called, in, by the way, this is called in series. 
Um, so this would allow you to actually have a longer life span on your batteries. So if you set up, say, five of these lead acid battery clusters next to each other, you could keep your lights on for multiple days or something. For for the example, I'll say you could keep your lights on for multiple days, but you wouldn't be able to power anything strong like, say, this mineshaft. Now, there is a way you can make even just this lead acid battery work in terms of getting to power one of these. Much easier done, obviously, with this one or with this one or any of the other ones, but you could technically do it with this one as well. But I'll show you for the example here. And so we're back now. Um, I went ahead and I set up a little test area. I know it's not the prettiest thing, but I just quickly set it up. So right here we have a diesel generator. It's running. It's outputting 240 power with the lead acid battery cluster, as you can see. It's, that's what it's going to. Uh, only accepts 80. Then you can see right here, this one also is going to a lead acid battery cluster, which accepts 80. And this one also is going to a lead acid battery cluster, which accepts 80. So these are corresponding right here. So each one has its own. As you can see, you can see that the power is going up and down very rapidly on both of these. But this one, it's fairly consistently actually moving up. And that is because these two, so by the way, this is an in, this is in parallel. These are an in parallel uh, setup, so that what essentially is happening is I'm using this output right here, this output right here, and this output right here, putting it into a coupler, which essentially allows you to combine multiple wires into one. And um, it's taking all three of those outputs and it's putting into one output of 200 or 399. So you can see right there, it, it's a fluctuating actually between 399 and 319. But the mine shaft only takes 215. So with this setup, currently with this setup, I can in fact power this mine shaft. However, one thing I should mention is if I were to turn off this one generator right here, you'll notice that I am now quickly draining the battery. So this is no longer power. This has no more power, but it, it'll fluctuate. And this one is now... So this one is still going up because we're not necessarily maxing its capability, I guess, which is a good thing. That's a good thing. That tells me you only need two of these to actually run it. I thought you needed three. So my math was wrong. That's fine. Um, but needless to say, if another one of these were to turn off, just to prove the example, instantly, without any change, the second I turn that off, this turned off. And that that is because even though the well even though this one has power, you can see right here that it's only outputting 160. These two are no longer outputting, and the as you can see the wires wires are not lit up. Uh, this one is lit up because there's power flowing to it, but there's not enough power for this mine shaft, so it's not taking any at all. So in order for it to take some, I have to turn on one of these generators and then all of a sudden it'll turn back on. But if you see right here, it says electricity, sufficient power, requires power. So that means we're having a problem with the power. So this is kind of an issue that I've noticed is it takes, it has a priority or a set on which one it wants to take first, and it'll take all from one. Like, let's just say all three of these are running. It'll take all the power from this one first. So 160 of its power it'll take. And then the next one, it'll take whatever the leftover is. And then this one will just be there for a backup. And so if we actually remove the third cushion 
or I guess this would be the cushion. If we removed, if we removed one of these from the series, you're going to start having this problem where it'll say sufficient power requires power, sufficient power requires power, because it's constantly fluttering back and forth. But if we were to turn this one back on, and now we're back on, it constantly says sufficient power. So realistically, you do need three to actually make this sustainably work, um, but you can technically run it off of two. I don't know if it will still give you the resources, but you can see we're getting resources. Um, so this is an in parallel sec uh, circuit. It's a little confusing with all these wires I got here, but the, you can see by this, it's flowing in and going into this one. This one's flowing in, going into that one and this one's into that one, but then they're all converging into this one area and then into the mine shaft. Okay, I'll show a better example hopefully over here. So this is a little bit more, ex I guess, crazy in terms of the capabilities here, but you can see we have a couple things. So we've got our light right here we have a splitter and we're gonna hook the splitter up okay so now we've got our splitter which is powered by this wind generator okay it's powered by our wind generator and it goes into this splitter which powers this light and powers this battery cluster and it also powers this other splitter which is called an expanded splitter this one's way later on you get um, but it essentially expands it from three slots all the way up to ten so as you can see we're not using any of these right now and that's mostly because there's not enough power to actually use them and this is going back on the issue that it has, since this battery is hooked up, it's going to suck up pretty much all the power that has left over because it has prioritization. It prioritizes one first, and then it'll deal with the rest of them later. Um, it doesn't evenly split between the, the different outlets. So if I remove this wire, all these lights turn back on again, and there's no issues. So yes, I could, if I wanted to, hook up 10 lights. Obviously, this isn't going to be the use case for it. There aren't too many use cases that you would need an expanded splitter for at the moment, because most of the time you can just get away with a regular splitter. But if you really, really, really needed to hook up a bunch of pieces of equipment to like one specific spot, um, you don't want to have a cluster of these or a series of these where they're where you have like a splitter for some reason. I don't know, let's say you could, I mean, in some case you might want to not do this. You might not want to do this to where you have your splitter here, which goes into another splitter, which goes into say another splitter. And you, could, you couldn't do that. There's nothing wrong with doing this. It's just, if you didn't, want to do this and you're in the later game like you're you've made it farther into the game you could just replace it with one of these and it will do essentially the same thing as this but it requires less power to run it and it'll give you 10 slots which is more than all of these combined so there is that that is your that is your splitters in effect and then the next one is your coupler so you can see the coupler is the same concept except for it's reversed so we can take three generators three wind generators and we can power one item this is a large titanium battery cluster we can hook it up and we can power it so now we're able to not only power this light but we're also generating power at, let's see here, we're getting a power of 157 in right now. And that's because we've got all of these generating wind. 
uh, power for us. So there is, that's the coupler, the basic coupler. Then you can obviously expand it to the bigger version. So this is the bigger version here, which you can see output wise, we can hook it up to the generator right here. And now we can generate its max. It's essentially taking in five, or 250, which is the most it'll allow into this battery because we're outputting 18, 1830 power between all these generators and then these three wind generators all going into this one battery, which a lot of it's being wasted because it only accepts 250. So that's there's not a lot of reasons as to why you'd want to use an expanded coupler as of right now, unless if maybe you wanted to charge five titanium battery clusters. But at that point, do you just make a separate wire going to it? It's, it's up to you guys. But needless to say, that is what it would do if you wanted to use the expanded coupler as well. Okay, next up. Next up, we're going to look at this uh, bike generator. This is something that I, I know myself has been kind of underestimating and hasn't really done anything with it. I've been quite literally putting off using it or even wanting to use it, but it actually is kind of interesting because it works in the same concept as the manual miner right over here. This is the manual miner. If you don't already know about it, you can you can gather ore or oil, and it's essentially you're sitting here AFK, and you're get you're gonna get ores and other stuff, oil from it. Now, what it does is this allows you to generate power. So it's the same concept. You're you can go AFK for a while, leave your keyboard, do your own thing, whatever, and your guy's gonna sit here and pedal. Um, it says it comes at a cost of your hunger and, and or thirst, but after a little bit of testing, I didn't really notice any difference. I don't think it actually does. Maybe it's a bug. Maybe it'll be implemented later. I don't know. But needless to say, you can see here we're powering this light by actually doing this spike generator, and we're also charging the battery with whatever is left over. So if I get off, the light turns off, and the battery stops charging, but we've charged, as you can see, 68,000. Now, this is also from me testing it as well, so it's not like I just gained 68,000 right away, but it is, it's pretty decent. It's 200 power, so we're actually getting 199 power every time it gives us some power. Okay. Next up. Let's see here. Let's, where should we start next? So... We kind of already covered circuit breakers, so I'm going to go ahead and cover them again. Um, so yeah, if you turn the circuit breaker on, the light turns on. You turn the circuit breaker off, light turns off. Um, this one is the same concept, except for it's a button. So as you can see, if we take out our wire tool here, it has an input, a signal output, and an output. So the output always will run no matter what. So anything, and this goes for every single thing that has an output. So this one included, if I were to hook up something to this, it would always output power as long as there's power coming into the input. Um, but in this case, this is where I'm going to show you it. Um, so the power comes in and it goes out to the output powering this light. However, if I choose, I can press my interact button and it will power this light just for a moment because that's how this works. It'll send out like a pulse of energy, um, just enough to power it for a blink of an eye, as you can see. It doesn't last too long. But it is something you can do um, once you get more into maybe making a switch that would turn it on and then turn it back off. Um, you'd have to play with it and figure out the logistics behind it, but you could technically do it. Um, next up is a... Uh, we're going to skip over that because we're going to come back to it. Next up, we're going to go to this. This is a timer here. If we go ahead and set it, we're going to go ahead and reset. And we're going to set it to five seconds here. You can see that this, the output once again is powering it all the time. But after five seconds, this one turns on and stays on. 
And then if we flip the circuit breaker, it'll reset it. And then it it'll flicker sometimes. Sometimes it won't flicker because it's it does it too quickly. Um, but needless to say, I'm going to turn it back off. And then you can see here, so it'll output. The light turns on. The light will send it back over to here. And since we have it turned off, it's upside down, so it's off. Um, you can see that the output will go to this reset, which automatically, if this is turned on, will reset this timer back to its time, and it will start itself again. So this is this is a a way of having something go off every x amount of seconds that you want it or minutes that you want to happen. If you want something to happen every every once in a while, you can set it up that way so that it'll constantly go through a cycle and start over again. So, there we go. And it will just keep resetting because the power is going right back through and it resets itself. And sometimes you'll see the light go on, sometimes you won't. It's just because of the update rate. Okay, so next we have a use for the button. So this button didn't quite really have a use, but you can see here we have a number two on this uh, counter. So there's an input for the counter, which I have going through the wall behind us, so you won't see the input, but... There's an input to the counter. Um, we have a signal input, a reset, a signal or an output, a signal output, and that is it for this counter. So what we have is we have our input coming in, giving it power. We have our signal input going over to our button. We have our signal output that goes down into this fluorescent light. The fluorescent light will bring the power back into the circuit breaker. Okay, the fluorescent light will bring it back into the circuit breaker. And the circuit breaker, if it's on, will power the reset and start it over again. So let's just quickly see how this works. So if I press E, it goes down to 1. You can see the light turned on for the wire. And then it now says 1. If we press the button again, it now says 0, turning the power on. So now our light has turned on after two button clicks. And then we can turn the circuit breaker and it automatically resets it back to two. And if I were to keep that on, you would have the same kind of issue where it would automatically reset itself. It wouldn't really light this. That's all just back down to the reset functionality of it. Okay, so let's just do it one more time. Run it, run it again. Light turns on, sweet. Now we reset it, everything's good. So, we have an input here and an input here. Both are receiving power, both the circuit breakers are off, and they're outputting into this, well this is what, it, what I call an OR gate, or is called an OR gate, and what it means is if one power is on, it'll power this output right here, which in this case is a fluorescent, fluorescent light. So let's just test it out here. If we turn this on, we get power because one of them is on. So this one is on, so we get power. If both of them are on, no big deal. That's not a problem. And if this one were to turn off now, it would still run because it, one of them has power. That's the OR gate. But if both go out, obviously the power goes out. Okay, that's an OR gate. Next, we have an AND gate. So the AND gate, essentially, once again, both these powered. Um, then we have them connected to the AND gate. As you can see, in the last one, in the last one we had, we turned one on, and it powered it up, and we turned it back off, it turned off. Well, as you can see, we turned this one on, it's running, but there's no power. So what this means is it requires power in one port and requires power in the other. So for both, both have to be on in order for this light to turn on. If one of these turns off, it doesn't matter which one, it'll turn the power off. So then we turn it back off and now, now it's back to how it was. Okay, next one. Next we have the NOT gate. 
So the knock gate works a little bit differently, but as you can see here, let's just go start by turning it on. It's the same concept, but you can see right here, this is the power. Okay, if we turn this off and turn that on, nothing happens. Well, what this is because of is this is essentially an input right here for the power, and this is a signal input. So what this means is if I turn this on for the power, it'll flow power no problem all the time. However, if power comes into the signal output or input, it will turn it off. So as long as this one is not running with power, it will keep itself off. So running with power, it's off. Not running with power, it's back on. So that is your not gate. Okay. So then next we show the... Uh, this is a little setup I made. Um, there's nothing nothing too crazy about it, but what it does is it's a self-resetting thing and it's self-counting, all that fun jazz. But as you can see here, it counts down from 5, and then it, or from 10, sorry, counts down from 10 and goes into the signal output, into the input of this splitter. The splitter sends back to the reset for this, so it restarts itself. The last power right here goes into the signal input. This is a little more confusing, but what essentially is happening is we're taking the power that's coming in from these, and every 10 seconds, we're counting down one on the counter, and the counter, once it gets to zero, will send power to this light for 10 seconds. So we could set this to one if we wanted to and always have it run at one. But you can see right here, once this gets down to one or to zero, technically, once it gets down to zero, it'll make this zero, which turns the light on for 10 seconds. So now for five more seconds, we now have light Four, three, two, one, and now we lose light. And the reason that is, is because we used we used a timer to count or to counter time and then we used the counter to do intervals between how often we want it to actually activate its 10 second light so we could change this to whatever we wanted to um but this is just one application to keep in mind as well but we used an and gate so that every time power comes out here and goes into this middle one and goes down into the and gate it'll send a signal down but since there's not a signal in both of these, it won't reset this clock. It only resets this clock once the power is on here and the power comes on back through here. So in four seconds, the power will come through and down into here, which will send it and reset back to five. So that's something you can kind of do with it. I mean, it's there's plenty of things you can do with all these different um, devices that they give you, but this is just one example of said device. Okay. So next up, next up we have a couple, we're actually going to do two in one here. We have a fixed uh, search light, um, but essentially it powers, and or once it's powered, it actually shows like a spotlight in the area. And then what I have it attached to here is a pressure plate. So as long as I stand on this pressure plate, and this could be anything. It could have a, you could have a turret attached to this or something that only turns on when someone steps by. Whatever you want. If it's anything that requires power, you could do that. But you can see once I step on this, the light turns on and it shines on those two bushes. So you could probably think of some applications if you wanted maybe a, I don't know, a search light or something for your base, and maybe at nighttime you have it activate. I don't know. You you can figure something out. As long as I'm not standing or something is not standing on this pressure plate, the light turns off, but once it is has something standing on it, it will turn back on. And I don't know if it counts for vehicles, but I want to say it does. So that is that. Is that.
Uh, let's see. Next up, we have your refrigerator and your freezer. So the refrigerator is just a basic storage. Uh, if you want food to not rot, you can... Uh... Okay. So if, if we see here, we have wild berries. They expire in... Or one of them will expire in 6 minutes and 20 seconds. However, if we put them in the refrigerator, it now becomes 4 hours. So the same can be said with the large freezer, but the only difference is that the large freezer, uh, let me quickly keep one of these. There we go, five hours. So the same, it's the same concept where these, the time is the same. Uh, the amount of time that you get per item is the same, it's just more storage. Um, however, one thing that is to be known is if I were to turn this off, let's just turn this, or get rid of this cable. If we were to turn this off, A, they're not powered anymore, obviously. The timer gets reset back, so any food in here can now spoil um, at a much faster rate, normal rate. Um, but you can see here, it requires to power uh, 20 electricity for this refrigerator and 30 for the large freezer. So really, two of these is only this much room. So we are, we'd be paying double the price to have this much room when, when you could have an extra uh, three, uh, three more rows down on our, on our uh, freezer. So it's, it is more worth it to have the large freezer rather than to use the refrigerator. However, you don't get this one till later on, but it is a, uh, a way of keeping your food good um, if you don't want it to go bad super quickly. Okay. Next, we have a... I haven't, I haven't really talked about these too much, but we have the wind generator here. This thing, as you can see, is getting a current power between 55 and I saw 61, but I think it's just 55 right now. Um, and it's powering this light. The other thing we have is the solar generator. So this is getting 20 power, um, and it has a max of 25. Now, typically with these generators, they usually don't. I haven't really seen any instances where they actually reach their max. So I don't know if there's any specific placement you need to do in order to get it to reach its max. But I do know that if it was nighttime, this actually would become unusable. It wouldn't turn on because at night it doesn't power. So if you do decide to make a solar generator, um, be warned that your stuff will not power during night, so you will need batteries or something to store the power from the day to go into the night. Um, with that being said, though, uh, storing the power, once again, you're limited to these batteries, which can be a little bit wonky. So you need to be careful on what what you want to do with your power that are attached to these generators, because they don't, they obviously don't produce as much power, as you can see. They're, 20 is not a lot. Compared to one of these generators, it does 240. And that is much, much more than what this thing could even ever uh, try to achieve. This one comes close, um, or closer, but you can see 55 is obviously not 240. So 240 kind of kicks its butt in terms of of that, but this is this will run 24-7, so that's the difference here. So if it was nighttime right now, this would stop working, but this would continue. And this only works if there's fuel. So if this ever runs out of fuel, let's say you you leave your base for an extended period of time and you're gone, um, then this will, would keep running your power even long after you're gone, as long as your base doesn't crumble into dust. You have a better chance of your base crumbling into dust than this thing running out of power. So... Yeah, that's that. And then the next thing I want to showcase here is the heater and the uh, the heater and air conditioner. So, what we have here is the heater will, as it 
it kind of implies in the name. Uh, if you look down, bottom left corner, it says a little player indicator with the temperature of my player. So if I stand on this heater, you can see that my temperature is now in the orange. So my character is getting a little warm. Um, nothing too crazy, but you can also see a, a new icon has popped up. So for this, you can actually control the crops. This is, I would say, primarily used for crops in general because temperature of your crops actually makes a difference on the output of what you get product-wise. So if you want to get more product from your crops, you would have to make sure that the heat is not too hot, but not too cold. Some require hotter temperatures, some require colder temperatures, some are somewhere in the middle. Um, but you have to kind of find that balance, and that's the hard part. But this heater will only heat up. That's all it does. Whereas the AC, or the air conditioner, will actually allow you to set the temperature, and you can set it to be hotter or colder. So if I'm right here now, you can see my character is getting colder. So that is what the air conditioner will do. This is a little bit harder to get than, say, the heater. The heater I think you get pretty early on, but this one takes much longer to get. So if you do need to do weather control for your crops, this is probably your better option. But if you're having a problem in the early game keeping your crops warm enough, then you could definitely use this heater. And if you're in the snow area, if you're in the snow biome, you definitely want to use the heater. Um, I think it produces a little bit more heat anyway. But anywho, let's go to the next one here. So next we have is the signal receivers. So these are a little bit interesting. I, uh, I was kind of playing around with them um, earlier, and I noticed that the thing doesn't work quite how I would have expected it to, but... It does work, so I will showcase it just because. So as you can see, we have a signal receiver here. It has a number code of 0001, and we have one right here that has a 0002. So if I wanted to, I could use this uh, number 5. On my number 5, I have this little tool right here, and this tool allows me to set a connection. So if I were to take this 0002 and turn it to 0001 and then click Merge, it'll turn this light on. If I click the back arrow and I make it a 2 and click Merge, it'll turn that light on, but it won't turn this one off because now I'm connected to both of them. So as long as I'm connected to the frequency by merging, I am now connected to two at the same time, and they will always receive power. However, if I want to remove the power, I click split, and now the power has gone off, and I can switch it back to one, and click split, and now the power is off on both. So if you wanted to do some remote control, you could be the range that it allows. I would assume your base has to be loaded for this to work, but I don't know. I haven't actually gotten far enough away yet to figure it out. But needless to say, if you wanted to, you could kind of play around with that and make something to where you can remotely control your base defenses or something or another. I don't know. The applications definitely are there. There's plenty of things you could do with it eventually, um, but I'll have to play around with it some more to kind of figure out. Um, and then next up, I will uh, finish off this episode here because we pretty much talked about everything I wanted to talk about. And to showcase this uh, this thing once again, I went ahead and I set up a little device here. If we click Merge, you can see we have set up an auto turret. So, you could technically activate something like that to where you could set up this remotely. I didn't have to be nearby this whatsoever. I just had to go and merge and now it's off again. And if I were to merge it again, I can turn it back on. So there is some practical use here with this. You can you can definitely play around with it. But for the most part, this is the uh, 
this is the gist of what you can do with power. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and uh, if you did, please consider liking the video. I would appreciate it. And I'm trying to get this out there just so that people can get a better understanding for power and how it works, because there's a lot to it. And if you do like this content, or maybe I didn't explain something well enough, you can always let me know in the comments, and I will be happy to answer it. And I, if I get enough comments on maybe something I did wrong or something I could have done better, then I could always make another video on it. But I only know based on what you guys tell me. So if you guys don't respond to it, then I won't know that anything's wrong, and I'll think everything's just fine. So that is said. Um, but if you do want to see more of this content, go ahead and click the subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next one.